morning. Good morning. It is October, believe it or not. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at San Ramon Presbyterian Church. And this is also the first Sunday of October. It's been recognized around the world as World Communion Sunday. So we have a special thing to keep in mind today that as we take communion, as we will be doing, and hopefully you will be doing that too at home, that this is an opportunity for us to reflect on the bigger body of Christ. It's not just our little group here. It's not even just the churches in this valley or even this country. But around the world, we have people who are taking communion. They speak in different languages. They're in different situations. Some of them are under persecution. But yet together, we say, Jesus, we believe in you. We trust in you. And together, we are the church, the body of Christ. So we look forward to that today. today. Also, we will be hearing from Pastor Mark as he continues our series on the journey And he'll be looking especially at what it means to have an outward focus in our walk with the Lord. So what a great time to do that as we think of the greater community of Christ, taking communion together to think of how Christ has called us to look beyond. So I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then our worship team is getting ready uh, to help lead us in song. Would you join me in a word of prayer this morning? Oh, Jesus, we thank you that you just didn't welcome 12 to your table. You've welcomed all. All who would come to you, Jesus. All. You say you are stand at the door and knock. If anyone would open that door, you would come in and eat with them. So, Lord, I pray that this morning we would open our hearts to you once again coming in. Maybe even those parts of our heart that we've kind of closed off. That, God, in every part we would allow you to come in and that you would give us, God, that focus that you had, Jesus, when you were here. Thank you, Jesus, that you invite us to come together as the body of Christ forever. So, Lord, we ask your blessing on this time. May we hear you. May we experience you. And may you change our focus into one that is like yours, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us this morning and sing one of the oldest hymns of the church. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. I love the third verse. It says, Praise to the Lord, who does prosper thy work, and he defends thee. Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder anew what the Almighty can do, because with his love he befriends you. Let's just celebrate this great hymn this morning together.
What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it, un put it under a bowl. 
Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In Acts 1.8, we read, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And at the same time, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. And proclaim that his name is exalted. That is something to cheer about. Praise God that he reigns. Hey, um, I want to invite you to have a seat if you're standing, if you're at home sitting, stay where you are. Um, hey, this is a time where we take some, uh, a moment to recognize our tithes and our offerings. But before we do that, I want to invite up uh, a couple of special people to tell us about a special event. And so I'd like to invite up Steve and Noah. Come on up. How are you guys? Well, we got, no, I think you need a microphone too, right? So let's do that. And uh, Steve, I'll let you lead us off here. Does it have a switch, Mike? Yes, it does. Oh. Thank All goodness right. I'm better with shovels and rakes. <laughs> 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 
Um, for those of you who haven't met the digital audience out there, I'm Steve Liao. I've been working on this Building Bridges project for 19 years. And thank you for that. That was a paid endorsement right there. Thank you very much for that. Um, let me just tell you, for those who don't know, we go out every year as a body of believers and reflect Christ's love in our community. We do that to elderly, widows, military, some of the overwhelmed households in the area, and just do some minor cleanup and repairs. We've been doing that for 19 years. Myself, I can just tell you, this gets me closer to Christ. He continues throughout my life, continues to just send people into my brokenness to show me that he loves me every single day. So when he opens the doors in the communities for us to walk through to reflect his love, there's no way I can say no to that. So <laughs> I just invite every one of you, if you haven't already done so, go to see Ed and Diane Thompson after church and sign up on those forms outside or go online for you at home. SRPC.org under what's happening. The form's right there. Sign up. And on top of that, I'm going to tell you about another fantastic journey about a brother of mine, Noah, through Building Bridges. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Liao. So um, I remember one Building Bridges in particular when I was only about eight or nine, and my family and I were out helping um, a family in Camp Parks. We were cleaning up and renovating their backyard. And I remember I was playing with the kids of the family, and one of the kids in particular was talking a lot and just talking and talking and talking and talking. And it was really cute, and I was like, wow, this is so great. I later on asked my mom, I was like, mom, why could somebody talk so long for so, like talk about so many things? And then my mom said, well, it's because they had a friend who would listen. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment that I was like, wow, I may only be eight or nine, and I can't really do what everybody else is doing, but God still has a plan for me, and he has a plan for each one of us, and how we're gonna bless our community. And as I've been doing building bridges throughout the years, I've been able to do more and more projects as I've grown up. And now this is gonna be the first year when um, I'm doing projects without my parents who are in uh, Mazatlan, Mexico right now. Uh, <laughs> let me just add this. For those of you um, that haven't done this before, the kind of projects we do are largely outdoors. They're gonna be repair and cleanup. But this year we're also gonna focus a lot of the kids that may have fallen behind during the pandemic, during virtual school. So there's an opportunity to sign up just to be a grandfather or a grandmother for the day. Go tutor some of these kids over at the Army base. They're signing up right now for tutoring in math, reading, sciences, um, or even just to sit around and talk like Noah talked about. So sign up for, there's gonna be a project for you. Whatever your skills are, whatever your capability, there will be a project for you. Please do sign up. All right, thank you so much, guys. And Noah, I want to ask you to stay up here for a minute. Um, first of all, Building Bridges is uh, October 16th, so you should have seen on the slide there. But uh, if you can sign up today, that makes it easier for everybody. And just say hi to Ed and Diane as you leave, if nothing else. Tell them you're praying for them and you're glad for Building Bridges. Hey, I asked Noah to stay up here because we got a message. Some of you may have heard this this week. His parents, as he mentioned, they're missionaries down in Mazatlan. And they asked us for prayer last week that they would be able to get through these sea trials. This has been like years and years they've been trying to get this ship into motion. Well, they sent a note out last night, Noah, that they passed through the sea trials. They've yeah. done it. They are passed. Yeah, it's super exciting. We've been going through this journey for so long, and it's like, oh, my goodness, we're finally getting here. So it's super exciting. Awesome. And Noah says, I was asking more details. He goes, I don't know. I'm going to be on the phone with him at 2, and then I'll learn more. So yeah. this just happened. We just give thanks to God. Prayer makes a difference. And keep praying them through. I think there's a final certification they still need. Um, but this is a huge thing for a vision that's been going on for, like, decades. Now, yeah, you know? exactly. So we praise God for that. Thank yeah, you. Thank awesome. you so much, Noah. Appreciate you. Well, this is a time that we recognize our tithes and our offerings, and thank you so much for many of you who give consistently and faithfully, whether online or, or uh, send things in. Uh, but for those of you who like to bring an offering to the worship service here, make it part of your worship, we continue to have a box in the back, and you can either uh, bring something before, during, or even after the service. We just want you to know that's there, if that's something you'd like to do, and, and make that part of your experience. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. Um, and then we're going to hear a message from Pastor Mark. So would you join me in prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for how you are moving. 
We thank you, Lord, how you're already moving for building bridges in hearts and minds, people we don't even know that we're going to connect with on teams as well as those that we'll be meeting in our community. We praise you for that. We thank you, Lord, that you've been moving this week in the, the EBO family and bringing a vision that you planted on them so many years ago is coming to life. We just thank you for that. Father, we thank you that you've given us the ability to, to participate with you. Lord, worship is a time where, yes, we receive, but it's also a time that we give, Father. Lord, you call us to give, whether it's in our worship and praise, we give you glory. Whether it's through going out, as the Bible says, worship is actually in our service too, serving and building bridges, or even in those resources we offer to you, Lord. God, it's all a way of giving. Lord, I pray this morning that we would be reminded once again that you call us not just to give to see how much we could do, but because you want us to enter into your joy. Lord, I pray this morning we would discover, and in the days, weeks, even months ahead, more and more the joy of giving away ourselves. Whether it be to one another, whether it be, God, to people far away as we think of other nations today, God, in some way, our joy would continue to increase as we trust in you. Lord, thank you. You know we need things. God, sometimes we really do just need to receive. But God, there's something special about the joy that you said you came for, Jesus, that you want us to experience too. So I pray that would be true today. And now, Father God, I pray as, as we hear from Pastor Mark, who has given himself to this message, who has poured out his heart, his mind, to prepare for this in your spirit, that we would give ourselves even to the sermon. We would give our minds, our attention, and say, we too want to seek you, Lord, in this. So God, we just give this time to you. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us so much. We offer this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have something a little different for you for the sermon today. Pastor Mark wasn't feeling well this week. And it's not one of those headline diseases or anything like that, but he just wanted to be careful. And uh, as a cold, basically, is what we believed, and he's checked it out. But just wanted to be cautious. So he pre-recorded this yesterday just to make sure we could hear from him and at the same time just be careful with all of us and also so he can hopefully heal. So Pastor Mark, we hope that you're watching this right now and know the love of this congregation for you. Um, but we're going to listen now and hear his word for us. And then after that, Pastor Don and myself will be back to lead us in a time of communion. All right, let's hear what the Lord has put on Mark's heart. Well, hello, SRPCers. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, I'm doing my message virtually today because I've been battling a cold all week. And I know with today's health sensitivities, we didn't want to expose anyone or make anyone feel uncomfortable. But we're in the middle of a series called The Journey. It's a series that's really based on things that you told us about your own experience of faith in Jesus and your experience at SRPC. The journey theme really has to do with a hike and a, a climb, an adventure, a trek. And so I'm dressed in the kind of clothes that I would dress in if I were to go out and take a hike. I love doing that in our area and even outside of our area. I've included my hiking boots because they're a favorite part of my whole hiking uh, attire as well. Hey, a special shout out to Matthew Tripp and the whole tech team for helping us put this together as well. Well, what we've done in this series is that we've listened to you first and foremost. We've helped, uh, you've helped us understand what your experience has been here of Jesus Christ and what your experience of the church is in relation to your faith. And then on the basis of that, we took a look and deeply prayed and asked for God's guidance in trying to determine what our best moves would be forward. Here's the thing. We believe that God has a great future for SRPC. Now, we don't know every single detail about that future, but we do know that it's a hopeful future. In fact, this series is really anchored in a verse of Scripture from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. Let me read it for you. It says, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They'll walk and not be faint. And that's why we're taking this journey. That's why we're taking this walk together. In fact, I've asked us, I've asked you to make a commitment to stay together this whole journey series. And that's why we passed out the first couple of weeks these carabiners, and I think there's still some left if you don't have one. A carabiner is a great tool for attachment, and we want to stay attached 
to one another through this entire series. So what we did in the first couple of weeks is we talked about base camp. Base camp is that place where you kind of get oriented to the hike. Base camp for us was where we talked about our core values as a church. And our core values are the things that matter most to us. Things that we will not compromise on. Things that will always be with us. And they're things for us that are anchored in the scriptures. Here's what they are. Loving generously. Growing relationships. Embracing service. Making disciples. And following scripture. Each one of those values is anchored in the scriptures. And we talked about that over the first couple of weeks. If you missed that, I encourage you to go back to our YouTube channel and take a look at those messages because they really do anchor us in terms of our core values. Well, today, what we're doing is we're moving out of base camp and we're actually beginning the journey that we believe God has called us to take as a church. In a sense, we're hitting the trail. The question is this, which trail? If you were to go to uh, a, a regional park or especially a national park, like let's say Yosemite, you would discover that there are hundreds, maybe thousands of trails that you would have the option to take. Well, in the same way, we had to ask ourselves this question. Of all the things that we could focus on, what are the trails that God would have us go down as a church for this next season of our life together at SRPC? Well, the answer to that question again, again came as we listened to you. When you filled out that survey, and over 70% of you did, you told us what mattered most to you. And that was great. It was so helpful for us to hear that. But then we asked a, a, an even more important and harder question. And our question was this, how are we doing at doing the things that are important to you? There were some areas that stood out as things that mattered to us as a church that we were not doing well. Those are the growth areas. Those gaps create opportunities for us to grow. Those places are the places we want to go. They're the trails that we want to take. So over the next few weeks, I'm going to talk about several of them, four of them actually, and I'm going to give two weeks to each of those areas so that we can together again understand the trails that we're going to take. The first trail, I would summarize it this way. The first trail that we have chosen to take is to become more outwardly focused. At SRPC, we want to become more outwardly focused. I'm going to talk about that this week and next week. Now, almost all of us who filled out that survey last spring said this, sharing our faith is a very important responsibility in terms of being a Christian. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're compelled to share your faith. We all said that. We all agreed to that. And here's the other point of good news. Over 90% of us said that we have close friends, good relationships with people who do not have any church affiliation, any church connection. They're unchurched folks. And we have relationships with people like that. We also put that together with some area demographics that we got a hold of. And we learned that within a five-mile radius of SRPC, there are 79,000 people who have little or no religious interest or connection. Imagine that, 79,000 people with no religious interest or church connection. We need to become more outwardly focused at SRPC. And we also learned that our community is growing fast. A and that the fastest places of growth in our community are among people who are younger in their 30s and 40s. And the fastest growth is among a diverse group of people, diverse ethnically, diverse in background and racially. And if you take a look at our church today, uh, we would have to agree that SRPC does not currently reflect our community. I've often said to people that if you want to know 
who's in our community. If you want to know what our community looks like, look to the left and look to the right when you're standing in line at Costco because that is our community. And right now, SRPC, we do not accurately reflect our community and we long to be a church that reflects our community in terms of people that are drawn to Jesus because of SRPC. So the trail that we're taking is to become more outwardly focused. And nobody did that better than Jesus himself. In fact, Jesus spent most of his time with non-religious people. So let's learn from Jesus today. I wanna take you to Luke chapter five, verses one through 11. This is just one of many accounts of Jesus engaging with people. Let me read it for you. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that the boats began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now, on, from now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. Notice right away Jesus' heart for people. Jesus is with the people. He's not in the synagogue. He's at the lake. Jesus is accessible and he's available to people. And that's not unusual in Jesus' ministry. He was always making himself available to people. He was always filled with compassion. In fact, in Matthew chapter nine, it says Jesus had compassion for the crowds in all of the towns and villages that he went through. Jesus' heart for people is all over his ministry. But in the Gospel of John particularly, Jesus, I'm sorry, the Gospel of Matthew particularly, Jesus talks about it this way. He says, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go look for that one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he's happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In that same way, Jesus said, your father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. You see, Jesus was accessible. He always had compassion on people, and he shows it in this encounter as he's teaching. But Jesus also made space for individual people. He does that for Simon, who we later know as Peter. I love how Jesus engages Simon. He, he doesn't say to Simon, hey, are you listening to me teach? Because I've got some really good stuff here, and you seem to be just distracted by folding your nets. Jesus doesn't start that way. He starts by asking Simon for a favor. Hey, hey can you push your boat out into the water a ways? And that makes a huge difference, to engage Simon like that. Listen, if anyone had the right to say to everyone they met, you better listen to me because what I'm saying will make a big difference in your life. If anyone had that right, it was Jesus. But he never did. He always approached people gently and with compassion. So Jesus asks for Simon's help. Let me ask you this. Do the people you know that don't know Jesus understand how much they matter to you? not as prospects for the faith, not as targets to evangelize, as people, as friends, as companions. You see, that's the starting point in being an outreach-focused church. It's to have relationships with people where they know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they just 
matter to us because they're people, because they're our friends. But George Barna did an amazing job in, in doing some research a number of years ago. In fact, for decades, the Barna Institute has helped Christians understand our, our connectedness with culture and what's going on culturally. And they did a survey a number of years ago where they engaged people in their early 30s and all the way up to their late 40s. A and they asked people about their understanding of friends of theirs who are Christians who want to share their faith with them. These were unchurched people. I want to read just from this book called Unchristian about their findings. Young outsiders generally do not get the impression that Christians have a good intention when it comes to trying to convert them. Most reject the idea that Christians show genuine interest in them as individuals. This was one of the largest gaps in our research because most Christians are convinced that their efforts come across as genuine, but outsiders, people who are not Christians, dispute that. When it comes to matters of faith, young outsiders are skeptical of, quote, the Jesus shtick. This is a key finding in our research. Only one-third of those outside the church believe that Christians genuinely care about them. No one doubted the fact that Jesus genuinely cared about them. And certainly Simon didn't to genuinely care about people like Jesus did. That's how we start to be outwardly focused. Now, I'll just say this. For me personally, that leads me to a place of repentance. One of the songs we sing oftentimes here at SRPC is a song called Hosanna. And some of the words of that song are this. Heal my heart and make it clean. Show me how to love like you have loved me. That would be a great prayer for all of us, wouldn't it? Show me, Jesus, how to love like you have loved me. Well, then Jesus goes on and he connects with Peter in a way that makes sense to Peter, to Simon. Fishing. Jesus actually outfishes Simon and that wins him over. Think about it. Simon heard Jesus' teaching and it's great teaching. People hung on Jesus' words, but that didn't win him over. Neither did the religious debates that Jesus had with people in the synagogue, and he had some pretty awesome debates. And neither did the impressive miracles. Those didn't win Peter over. What win, won Peter over was fishing, when Jesus outfished him. Jesus connected with Peter's world, and that connection is what won Peter over. Look at the Gospels. Jesus is always finding people where they are, and he's connecting in ways that they understand because it feels awful not to understand someone that knows something that you don't. I told you a while back that we're doing this project at our house. We're kind of redoing our, our master bathroom, and so we've got contractors in the house, and I have just become so keenly aware of the fact that this is not my world. It really isn't. I, I can't even understand the questions that they're asking me about what I prefer around the stuff that they're doing. I, I, I practically need a translator. They're speaking English, but I don't understand what they're saying. Well, inside the church, we can develop a whole dialect, a whole vocabulary that's meaningful to us but it makes no sense at all to people outside the church walls. Jesus connected with people by using words and images that made sense to them, to everyday ordinary people. Think about this, the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were in the synagogue and they were debating Mosaic law and they were debating Levitic codes and that's important at one level, but check out what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying things like this, hey, you ever notice birds? I mean, birds seem to have all of their needs met. The reason is that God cares for them. And guess what? You matter a whole lot more than birds. Jesus would say something like this. Hey, when you do dishes, 
it's really important to clean out the inside of the bowl or the inside of the cup, right? I mean, that's what you want to get really clean. Well, here's the thing. Super religious people, overly religious people, they focus so much on the outside of the bowl and making sure that's clean that they forget that their insides are filthy dirty. See, that makes sense to people. (laughs) Jesus said this. He said one time there was a woman who lost a coin, and that coin meant so much to her that she tore the house apart to find the coin, and when she found it, she did a happy dance. He said, Lost people matter even more than that to God. So God will search everywhere to find lost people. He'll do whatever it takes to find them. Isn't that great? It's everyday language for everyday people. Jesus was a master, and we need to get good at that too. One of the things that we learned in our survey is we are a church that knows the Bible well. And that is to be affirmed. It's to be applauded. But we need to connect more and more with people outside of the church and build relationships with them. And that, at times, requires a whole different vocabulary. Same truth, different vocabulary. We need to genuinely care for people. We need connect with, to connect with words and in ways that make sense to people. So let me wrap up with this question. What's it like outside this room? What's it like out there? Let me give you a a couple of thoughts. People out there, people who are not a part of the church in their 30s and 40s, which is predominantly where the growth is in our community, they resonate with spiritual conversations, but they don't like to be cornered into talking about faith. Now, that may not seem to make a whole lot of sense, But let me put it this way. Nobody likes it when there's a target on their back. If we approach relationships, if we approach people as if there's a target on their back and we have to win them to Jesus, it blocks us from ongoing genuine relationships with them because people can sniff that out. So what do we do? We simply build genuine relationships and trust God's timing in terms of when we share and what we share. Jesus actually talked exactly about that in Luke chapter 12. He said, the Holy Spirit will give you words at the right time. In other words, there is no script. It's just relationships and trusting God's timing for what you're going to share. Just get to know and love people and be available to God. What's it like out there? I'll tell you what it's like. Personal is better than programmatic. Bigger is not better. That's what people outside of these walls think. Personal is better than programmatic. Bigger is not better. Now, people like me, my age and older, we remember so affectionately Huge campaigns and crusades like Billy Graham. In fact, I gave my life to Jesus through a Billy Graham crusade. And and we long for those days when thousands of people would gather together. We would love to think of ways to, to do something big for a huge, a big impact for the gospel. Let me tell you something. Out there, they're not thinking like that. Bigger is not better anymore personal is better. That's a huge benefit, actually, for us at SRPC, because think about it. We could never pull off an enormous, enormous event that would bring hundreds or thousands to Jesus. We could never pull off that kind of event. But every day, every single one of us is engaged in personal relationships, People in their 30s and 40s, people that aren't a part of a church but are interested in spiritual conversations, they're saying this, that's where I want to hear about Jesus. Not at a big thing, but from a real person. You're that person, and so am I. Finally, out there, not in here, but out there, the journey is more important than the destination. 
people in their 30s and 40s have been raised in an environment where certainty is up for grabs. And that is so hard for people like me, and it's so hard probably for people like you to hear, because most of us know and understand that heaven or hell hangs in the balance. And so how can you look at anything in a fuzzy sort of journey way and not be thinking about the destination? Here's the question that I have to ask myself, and I'll ask you too. Can we trust God with someone else's journey? Can we trust God with someone else's journey? Can we trust God so much that we could just be available to God as God sees fit to use us in their life? We know from the Bible, this is so clear, that God does not want anyone to perish. The question is, do we trust that? Do we really trust God on that truth? 1 Peter 3.15 says this, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is within you. But do this with gentleness and respect. You see, you don't have to hit a home run God just wants you to be on the field, playing your position. Always be prepared, but do this with gentleness and respect. Isn't it wild that Peter, the same Peter that Jesus outfished, wrote those words? You think Jesus had an impact on his life? You bet he did. So here's what Jesus did, and, and we can learn from him. Jesus genuinely loved people, all people, but especially people who were far from God. Jesus loved so much that he put himself in places and with people that raised the eyebrows of the religious people. If we are only hanging out with people that think like us and in places that are comfortable to us, we're not being a whole lot like Jesus. We're not loving like Jesus loved. Each week during this series, I'm offering a, a next step. And this is a way to put the message into practice. Remember, God's word tells us, don't be just hearers of the word, but be doers of the word. That's where growth happens, and that's what we want to be about here at SRPC. That's what you want to be about in your life with Jesus. You want to grow. And so here's the next step. <laughs> Practice loving like Jesus. What does that mean? It means this week, meet up with someone who sees and experiences life different than you. Maybe it's a person who's younger. Maybe it's a person of a different race. Maybe it's a person that came here from a different country. Meet up with someone who sees and experiences life different than you. Grab coffee with them. Take a hike with them. Hit golf balls with them. Have a beer with them. Wherever it is that they are, show up there. Connect in their world. That's what Jesus did. And when you're there, just listen. Be curious. With no agenda other than to get to know and love them like Jesus. The first move of love in another person's life is to listen. It's to listen. To learn who they are and what matters to them and why. So stay curious in your relationships. Can you imagine what would happen if dozens of people outside our church this week began to understand in a personal way that someone they knew that went to a church really cared enough to listen. You know what I think would happen? Their life would change a little bit and our hearts might change a lot. Let's become an outreach-focused church. That's the trail that we're on. 
And let's stick together and do this. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you're building your church and we make ourselves available to you. So this week we pray that you would fill us so much with your love, a love that longs to connect with people, that we would go out and do that. Help us in connecting with people to just listen, to stay curious with no other agenda than to love them like you love them. We are your church, Jesus, and we want to turn our focus outward. Amen. Pastor Don and Pastor Mike are going to lead us in communion this morning. We'll see you at the table. God bless. Mark, uh, you genuinely love us and you love us well, and we're grateful for that. And uh, I'm going to lead us into the words of institution here as we, we hang out at base camp, the communion table, one of our places of base camp, and then Mike's going to lead us into prayer. But before I do that, I'm going to ask you, if the in-house folks, if you didn't receive your elements, just raise your hand. One of the ushers will bring it to you. Our, uh, our homies... Our Zoomies, go find your elements and have them. And then after I do the words of institution, we'll have about 30 seconds of just some meditation time. And then, and then we'll take the elements together on this World Communion Sunday, united with our brothers and sisters across the globe. But as I was thinking, pondering Mark's sermon and prepping for this, I flashed on, there's Jesus. As he's headed to the cross, reflecting his genuine love for people, sitting there with, well, we could call him the tax collector today, which they did of his age, which was maybe the most despised person in certain corners of his world. And there's the zealot, who today some of us might call the terrorist who wanted to turn upside down the political system even through violence if necessary. And then there's the traitor, Judas. He's at the table. And I was struck by Jesus' genuine love is that my life is still going to be engaged with you no matter where you're at. And then we on the other side of the cross in the resurrection, the ones who have already had our bowls clean. (laughs) Why do we come to base camp? Jesus has already cleaned our insides. Well, part of the reason we come to base camp is simply this. Because don't we sometimes let the insides get dirty? (laughs) That maybe we become the ones who... uh, hold poor attitudes one towards another. Don't we let hatred creep into the insides of our bowls and dirty them, hold things against people? And so Jesus tells us, come to base camp, come to the table. Because there, as he was headed to the cross, as they were eating, he took the bread And he said that this is my body. It's broken for all the despised, all the terrorists, all the traitors. Every time you eat, remember, I broke my body for you, says Jesus. And then after they had finished eating, he took the cup. He said it would have had to be a very strange thing for them. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant. The old is fulfilled. And it's fulfilled through my blood. So every time you drink, remember this. We live in the new covenant. Our insides are clean. We continue to allow him 
through confession to turn us into the people he's designed us to be so that we can go genuinely love others as he did. Let's reflect for a few moments and then we'll eat and drink together. Jesus how awesome it is that we can pray to you right now as if we were those disciples in that upper room what a glorious gift you've given us and and one day Lord we will eat with you anew so this is a promise of what is yet to come Lord it may seem kind of tiny this little packet and yet Lord it's huge what it represents have your blood poured out for all of humanity your body given for all. Man, Lord, what we hold in our hands is powerful. And yet, Lord, it's so intimate because when we take and bring it into ourselves, it's a reminder, Father, how personal you want to be with us, to fill every part of us, to break those things, God, we still hold on to, as Pastor Don just shared and we heard from Mark. So, Father, we do a powerful thing. It's a thing of obedience but it's also a great gift. So Lord, may we receive this with joy and may you fill every part of us anew. We ask in your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Eat and drink as clean, forgiven, loving people.
a place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all Thank you for those of you who've been here present this morning, whether on 
online or here um, in this room. Hopefully you've sensed the presence of God. Hopefully you've uh, been able to receive something from him and maybe give uh, something up as well. Hey, just want to mention a couple things and then Pastor Dong's going to give us a benediction to conclude this morning at least. Hey, we've been talking about growth groups. These are groups of about 8 to 12 folks that get together. And uh, this is a season. And in fact, on October 14, we're going to start new growth groups. If you're not in a growth group, you need to email Katie McConville, like right now, so she can get you connected up. If you don't have her email, it's on those uh, emails that we send out every Saturday, or you can talk to myself or Don. We will get you connected. Pastor Mark talked about the importance not only of us going out, but the importance of us being together as we do that. We're not meant to do this alone. We're meant to be in community, in close-knit community. So this is your opportunity. There's a growth group that needs you, and you hopefully will need them too. So go ahead and do that, and then, of course, look for those red shirts. They're out there. Ed and Diane, they are ready to go. And uh, please go. And like I said, just encourage them. Be praying for building bridges as they put those final things together. Invite friends. But this is our opportunity to build that too. Pastor Don. Mike, what an awesome morning. Uh, it was cool. It was an awesome yeah. morning. Especially we got some cowbell. <laughs> we always need more cowbell. cowbell. Yes. 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 Hey, we sang a song at the beginning in which the lyric was, Ponder a new what the Almighty can do. Demonstrating why I don't write music, I'm going to add, ponder anew what the Almighty can do through you, through me, as we listen and we love curiously those folks that are our neighbors. Amen? Amen. 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 Have a great week.